So having just kicked the entire last decade of energy uh, ventures to the, the curb, there are a couple of companies that at Technology Review whom we revere. And one of them is the CEO of the company you're about to meet in a few moments, Chris Norris, the CEO of Alter Devices, which is working on a very radical approach to uh, solar voltaic technology, which get the price down to a point where it might begin to be competitive with hydrocarbons. Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I was very pleased to see there was no more room on that slide that Bill showed. So um, uh, I kept looking. I'm not up there. Um, uh, I thought, you know, by way of introduction, first, it, it's certainly an honor to be here and a pleasure. Uh, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about myself, and, um, and then I'm going to describe for you the, the path that we've taken at Alta Devices from concept to early commercialization. Uh, so to, to start with, I was born in this tiny town in uh, southeastern Idaho. Its name is Howe, and it's population 23. So there are no zeros, just literally 23 people. And it's on one side of the Idaho desert, so there's these little outposts like my hometown. And on the other side of the Idaho desert, it's the Snake River Valley and all of its farming towns. So in that desert region, though, are the Idaho National Labs, which is where most of our country's early research into nuclear power occurred, and it's where my dad worked. So I actually grew up hearing about breeder reactors and fuel rods and projects with all these crazy names like TAN, LOFT, and ZIPPER. Uh, so after, after growing up, went, going to school, uh, earned an electrical engineering and computer science degree, uh, went to Silicon Valley and spent over 20 years in the semiconductor industry. And I found myself in a venture firm, and I began to think about you know, how do I spend the rest of my career working on something uh, maybe more meaningful and lasting than the next video game chip? So at that time, I, I had a friend and investor, his name's Andy Rappaport, uh, introduced me to another investor and founder of Sun Microsystems, Bill Joy. And then Andy and Bill collectively introduced me to two professors, one Harry Atwater at Caltech, and the other Eli Yabinovich, who was nominated for a Nobel Prize in Photonics last year. So really top-notch guys. And Harry and Eli had spent the better part of their career doing research on ways to grow very, very thin layers of crystal, perfect crystals, using compound semiconductors, and primarily gallium arsenide. So eventually, this collaboration between investors and researchers and then myself became Alta Devices, and, and I joined as the founding CEO, and, and I've been there for the five years that, that we've been around. So today, you know, I'll do a little bit to lay some context. I, I think uh, Nate and Bill did that very well already, but then I'd, I'll show you some examples of how we approach the technology scale up in a different way, and also how we think about our business model in a different way. So first, it's really easy to be skeptical about alternative energy. I mean, it's not hard to be skeptical about the ability of a solar panel to compete with a nuclear reactor. That is not a very easy thing to do. But, you know, I think the most important thing that we can all agree on is that we need choices. And some of those choices simply have to include sources of energy that aren't fundamentally finite. And so I think the sun is a great example. And we have this big ball of energy, and it's not very far away, and it's going to be there for the next four billion years. And so each day, it delivers its energy to Earth, and in fact, it's the source of almost all the forms of energy that we've ever used. So I can't really imagine a future that doesn't involve some amount of harnessing that energy that we get for free. Here's one of the most important reasons why. This chart shows the electricity usage in China and the US over the past 12 years. So historically, the United States consumes between 3.6 and 3.9 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity every year. In fact, it's been flat for decades. China, in the year 2000, consumed about 1.2 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity, or a little less than one third of what the US consumed. In 2010, they were the same. China consumed the same amount of electricity that the US did. This year, China will consume 5.2 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity, and it's the largest consumer on the face of the Earth. So when we talk about energy in the United States, it's always about optimization. But when you talk about energy in countries like China, it's about survival. So as we heard, there's been a, a lot of investment in solar and not a lot of successes. Um, you know, economically, 
Uh, you, you know, that's not completely true. It sort of depends on your perspective on the, on the silicon side. But certainly, success in bringing new technologies to the market has been, um, has been dismal. What happens, and what most of those companies on that list tried to do, was define a material set, get a prototype working, and then go build a big factory so that you can compete at scale. And now you're competing with some of the most advanced forms of centralized energy ever invented in the history of man. Extremely difficult to do. Anything goes wrong, you are out of business. So you have to take a different approach to scaling. So this is a picture of our um, thin film gallium arsenide solar cell. Uh, it's thin, it's light, it's flexible. I, I always carry my sample so I can wave it around. But you know, they literally look like this. They're like pieces of plastic. What you can't see is that this solar cell um, is also the most efficient uh, single junction solar cell on the planet. It's 29%, and it's got a roadmap to 38%. So it's a, different, it's a different type of solar cell. So that's all great. So why don't we start pumping those puppies out, slap them on buildings, and uh, cover the desert with solar farms? Well, you know, the, the problem is that it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to bring these things to scale, and not many people know how to do it. And then for cases like solar, there has to be an infrastructure in place to capture that energy and then deliver it to where it's needed. And in most parts of the world, that doesn't exist either. So you have to take kind of a completely different approach. And what we've done at Alta is sort of from the beginning focused on, on this very methodical, one step at a time approach to building our technology and building our business. So when we started our company, we rented an empty building, but we didn't put any equipment in it for a year. So instead, each time a person would join, we'd run down to Costco, we'd buy a plastic table and a computer, and then we'd just add them to our group in the middle of this building. And so then after a while, when we finished working on whiteboards, it was time to actually see if some of these concepts would really work. So we partnered up with the uh, University of Wisconsin, and we went there to grow some of our films, these very thin crystals, using their equipment and some of their expertise. And once we had some early good results, well then, we built a mechanical model. And so now we had to figure out, can I get wafers in and out of a machine at the rate that I need to to compete in mainstream solar? It was only then, one year after we started the company, that we bought our first piece of real equipment, and that was off eBay, and it's a used uh, commercial MOCVD reactor similar to the one that we had used at Wisconsin. And we modified this machine so we could run exactly our process, and then we could run one wafer at a time. After that worked out, we said, let's go build our own. So now we can heat the wafers, and we can cool the wafers, and we can grow exactly the way we want with the gases flowing in the machine. And now we could grow two wafers at a time. That took a year. The next step, an even bigger machine. This is the first production prototype machine. It's built with an equipment partner. Now we could grow 16 wafers at a time. That took us another two years. And then finally, four and a half years after we started the company, we've started work on the first production tool. So it will be fully six years after we're founded before we actually have the very first production tool that does the most important thing in our process, and that's to grow our films. So the, the point is, this stuff is complicated. Uh, there's a lot to discover and a lot to learn, and it, it takes a long time. 